So that'll be really cool. And without further ado, uh, here's Professor Trumpy. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dominic. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here with you. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you all taking uh, time out of your schedules to be able to think about climate and climate change and things we can do. Um, certainly, it's important work that uh, we all need to get engaged with. So um, I'm a professor at U of M in Ann Arbor. Um, my home school is the School of Art and Design, but I also have appointments in our program in the environment uh, and School for Environment and Sustainability. And I also direct a living learning community for first year undergrads that's called the Sustainable Living Experience. So um, kind of have my uh, fingers in a lot of, of, of pies across U of M here, which is nice. Um, and our plan here today is, um, I thought I'd provide some climate change context, nothing too earth shattering, I think for most of you, but uh, uh, things to think about and to focus our, our thoughts a little bit. Um, really kind of hone in. I know some of you aren't from Michigan, um, but the fact that the uh, organizers are from Michigan and I'm from Michigan, uh, I thought we'd dig in on Michigan energy just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about my creative practice with you. And then, you know, I thought we'd pivot a little bit into thinking about some hands on things that um, people can do, especially high school students uh, and college students, what y'all can do to hopefully uh, facilitate some change here. So uh, I'm pretty confident uh, that you all are familiar with the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, hopefully you are. If you aren't, um, we can get caught up on that a little bit in the Q&A. I'm hoping to leave 15, 20 minutes for us to engage in, in conversation here at the end. Um, you know, I think the big, uh, the big things for us to pay attention to uh, is that one and a half degree Celsius cap that we're trying to achieve, um, not because life on Earth ends if we hit two degrees, uh, but we know that um, the business of, of humanity gets a lot more difficult above 1.5. So if we can do everything in our power to get us on a trajectory to not experience greater than a 1.5 uh, temperature shift, life will be easier. Um, so um, you know, these, these reports are pretty technical, even though they have, you know, hopefully some of you even downloaded the reports or participated in some online conversations. I think it's worth kind of looking at and thinking about these are the folks, these are the scientists, these are the, the experts that are communicating about this stuff. These are charts that I downloaded from the general public version of these reports. And you can see they're still highly technical and really not that engaging for an average user to kind of get into them. So I think, you know, if you're thinking about a long-term career in the sciences, uh, really be mindful about communication skills and how you visualize your work, get some visual people engaged on your team, really work on how you discuss uh, your, your scientific work with the public, especially. Um, so, you know, this is basically, um, we, we see this 1.5 degree cap. I'm not gonna dig into this, but this is one of the critical um, charts out of there. And I just kind of put it there to, so you can see and appreciate some of the complexities. This chart is a little bit more important for us to think about. Um, for us to hit that 1.5 degree goal, um, we need to be on this downward trajectory for burning and getting carbon into the atmosphere uh, to be able to go really carbon neutral by the year 2050. So, you know, we're already here past 2020, you know, we're 2022. And at 2030, um, we should be halfway to our goal there. So, you know, two things that it would be helpful if it's not already in your um, kind of uh, vernacular is to think about uh, carbon neutral by 2050 and burning half the amount of carbon by 2030. Those are the two big important goals that we need to really be mindful of and really be pushing hard to achieve. Um, you know, visuals are important. My, my training is in science illustration. Um, I have degrees in biology and art and illustration and, and have been doing sustainability work for 30 years. I grew up a Boy Scout in the 70s um, and used to drive by uh, this power plant all the time to go on my weekend trips. Uh, and, um, you know, the visual impact, you know, certainly this is an environmental justice impact for the folks who live close to this coal-fired plant. Um, we're still burning a lot of coal, 
most of us don't see these plants unless you happen to live close by or it's part of your daily commute. Um, but your power is coming from somewhere. Um, so one of the um, kind of environmental literacy questions that I would encourage you to think about is asking the questions about like, hey, where does my power come from? How is it generated? Uh, where does my water come from? What watershed am I a part of? Where does my garbage go when I'm finished with it? Where does my recycling go? All of that stuff has impacts uh, and it certainly has impacts on local communities. Um, this slide is, is kind of sharing a little bit of, of historical difference of the time I grew up um, versus kind of contemporary times for you all. Um, in, in, I, when I was a Boy Scout in the late 70s, you know, it was on the heels of the first Earth Day. Acid rain was a big thing. We were on the heels of the Cuyahoga River and the Rouge River and the Detroit River catching on fire. Uh, and uh, it wasn't very difficult for us to look at the environment as being dirty and that we were using the soil and the air and the water as um, a toilet basically to, to handle all of our waste to the point that the rivers were catching on fire and it wasn't very difficult for us to build consensus that like dude man we need to do something about this we didn't need to take a vote to say like hey show of hands here who thinks that you know rivers should be on fire or not on fire everyone was able to be like that's bad, we got to fix that. Um, and now we're, we're at a different point um, where we're dealing with subtleties of the amount of carbon in our atmosphere and we can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't taste it, we can't smell it, it's invisible. You know, it's a beautiful sunny day in Ann Arbor today um, and you wouldn't know that, um, you know, before I give a talk, I always look up what the, the atmospheric carbon is and this week we're at uh, 419 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You know, a good goal is 350 parts per million. It's a hard conversation now with people to be able to say like, hey, we should be at 350, not 418 or 420. You know, it's, it's very abstract. This is a great animation coming out of NASA um, with them visualizing, um, using uh, remote sensing and, and satellite data to visualize carbon in the atmosphere. Um, so they very intentionally chose color cueing to make it look like the atmosphere is on fire and it has a lot of impact. Um, but how we visualize and talk about stuff is really important. This is a complicated chart. I don't want to get into it too much just to give you some context here though about energy. This comes out of Lawrence Livermore in California. They do this chart annually. It's really detailed in terms of um, and volumetric in, in the way it's presented, which is why I like it. So you can you can see our different uses between residential, commercial, industrial, transportation. You know, if we really hone in on e electricity, we're not really going to talk about transportation today. <clears throat> I really just want to kind of think about electricity primarily because if we're thinking about our buildings, um, housing uh, and commercial buildings and industrial buildings account for about three quarters of that total electrical generation. Uh, so most three quarters of our grid goes into our buildings. So if we can start to think about how to do our buildings better, use less electricity, um, we can reduce these loads. Thankfully, that coal number continues to reduce. That natural gas number has increased. Um, you know, for all the PR that we see and, and what we hear about solar uh, and wind, wind continues to grow, which is good. Nuclear and hydro stay about the same. Solar is just growing a tiny fraction. Uh, one of the things you can see is there's no uh, electrical or waste heat generated from, from solar, which is cool. Um, but that gives us some good context to think about uh, the potential for solar, um, which is enormous. This chart comes out of a um, New York Times report in 2017 that really visualizes how electricity is generated state by state in the US. Uh, and if you're not from Michigan, you can you can go find it easy enough on the web. Um, so you can see that there's been power plants switching between coal, coal plants shutting down, natural gas plants opening up. You can see that uh, nationally, uh, that little yellow streak down at the bottom is solar. So again, there's that little bit of solar, little bit of wind. Those are our renewables. Hydro goes in there. Nuclear, we could lump in there. But you can definitely see we're still burning a lot of stuff. More than half of our electrical generation is from burning uh, fossil fuel. Some states are worse. Some states are terrible. Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Iowa, Illinois, lots and lots of coal generation. Here in Michigan, thankfully, we've got a good amount of nuclear. Um, 
but you can still see that more than half of our power is coming from burning things and we need to stop burning. And if we need to visualize that chart again, how do we get to be half that amount of burning by 2030, eight short years from now? It's a pretty steep goal. And how do we get down to not burning anything by 2050? Um, is Those are serious goals that we've really got to be mindful about. Again, the visuals are important. Um, you know, this is the, the front page for energy.gov, which is talking about energy policy a lot. Um, and, you know, if we had more time, we'd engage what we see here. But clearly we see technology and technological solutions down the, down the road, which could be. Um, but we've got some good solutions right now, which are solar and wind and behavior. Uh, and we really need to lean into those things to make the difference. And we need to learn how to be critical, too. If anybody hears from Lansing, this is the Board of Water and Light uh, logo from, from Lansing. Uh, and if, if we were to tease this apart very literally, you know, we, this would tell us, hey, a third of their production is, is from solar, a third of their production is from wind, and a third of their uh, activities is about uh, a stable grid to get the power to us. You know, if, if we were being generous, we would say that's aspirational. If we were being skeptical, like I am, I would say that's a lie. Um, that that is misleading the consumers, that's misleading the public. Um, that should be natural gas and coal and the grid on there. Um, so people need to understand um, what's going on because we plug our stuff in, we expect it to work, um, but it's a big footprint. We won't get too lost here, but if you're from Michigan, we've got two big electrical providers, DTE and consumers. Uh, over where you guys are in Battle Creek, your consumers over here in Ann Arbor, we're DTE, which is our energy partner at U of M. Um, they're worse. They're kind of a drag. They are a drag. They're burning a lot of material. Um, and they're not very progressive in thinking about their solar policies and their wind policies are, are okay, growing, um, but they're slow. Um, consumers is a little bit better. Um, you can see too, here's DTE, uh, responsible for greater amounts of air deterioration, air pollution in the Midwest than, than other regional pr producers. So uh, lots of room for improvement there. Um, good ways for, I'd say, uh, student groups to get involved and activated to be able to say like, dude, where's our power coming from? You can find the map of where our local generators are, find out what they're doing, what they're burning, have conversations with your administration to be able to say like, we need to work with our providers and or we need to do something different than our providers, which we will talk about. You can see consumers is doing a little bit better with 11% renewables. Uh, and a little bit less coal in their mix. And they are a little bit more progressive about um, solar grid tied systems, um, but still not as, as proactive as many in, in the country. Just a couple other different charts here for us to see what Michigan is doing. And again, you can go to EIA, EIA the Energy Inform Information Agency for your own states if you're not from Michigan to kind of see this mix. And you can see we're still burning, 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 burning. And we need to get off the burning. And this chart reinforces how much of our energy is going into buildings. This is total energy. If we looked at electricity alone, again, three quarters of our electricity is going into buildings. So how, how we behave in our buildings and what we're doing in our buildings has a major implication on our electricity consumption. So even if we just start to think about the mass amount of coal, it's hard for us to visualize. So, um, this is an interesting study of comparing different kinds of societies. This was a small island society off the coast of India, um, basically doing uh, sustenance ag, basically two tons per person of material per year. That's about 12 pounds of materials per person per day. We can visualize that. A Western industrial society, so they have Europe, Canada, US, North America all lumped into there. Uh, 40 to 80 tons of material per year. At the low end of that, it's like Denmark and, and Norway on that 40 ton. Uh, 80 tons is Canada and the US, which equals about 480 pounds of material per person per day. And you're like, dude, I'm not consuming. Where, you know, where's all that waste? Where is all that coming from? Uh, and it's two main things. One is concrete. And if, if concrete has a major carbon footprint, if concrete was a country, it would have the fourth largest emissions on the planet. Let me say that again. If concrete was a country, 
it would have the carbon emissions equal to the fourth largest country on the planet. Also part of that big pile of consumption is burning coal. So that's a big pile of coal that we're burning every day. Uh, and we don't see it because it's behind the scenes uh, and, and it's likely that most of us aren't being impacted by uh, the direct impact of the emissions. Certainly globally, we're all feeling the impact of those emissions. So that's a, uh, an environmental justice issue. Um, I lifted this chart from a, a permaculture um, uh, textbook. Um, permaculture is an idea in agriculture of how do you uh, attain uh, permanent human culture through a, a more sustainable agricultural method. Um, the nice thing about this chart is, is basically stretching out over time, thinking about uh, agrarian societies of 10,000 years before present, uh, and then moving off thinking about future time in, in terms of an old growth forest or great grandchildren. Um, so certainly industrial revolution and getting addicted to fossil fuels has led to a lot of success for our species. Uh, but now that we, you know, we, we could talk about peak oil or peak fossil fuel consumption, um, you know, it's clear that we, we can't keep consuming it. We've got to leave it in the ground and not burn it. So there's a few alternatives here. One, one we can call techno fantasy, um, where we're, we're thinking about technology saving us, personal fusion reactors. There are fusion reactors that will come on the line in, in the future for sure. Certainly not in the next eight years, probably not by 2050. So we've got to do some other things. Uh, green tech is stability. So bumping down the curve, but still having a pretty big footprint. I, I like to um, call this kind of the Arnold Schwarzenegger effect from when Arnold was governor of California. California has the, the most progressive energy policies in the country. Uh, but when Arnold was governor, you know, he'd talk about like, hey, nobody's saying you got to give up your Hummers. We're, we're, you can still drive your Hummer, but instead of putting in diesel or gasoline, we'll put in biofuel. Um, so it's basically changing uh, brown tech for a little bit of green tech. Uh, but certainly not deep green. Um, I like the idea of creativity taking us down that energy curve and permaculture is the example there. And then this last one is kind of the crash and burn post-apocalyptic uh, hunger games uh, sorts of things that uh, you know, y'all have read and, and uh, understand. So uh, I'm gonna pivot here a little bit uh, and, and talk about my own creative practice and um, certainly, I've been thinking about electricity and, and uh, energy systems and food systems in depth for about 30 years. Uh, and at the center of my design practice is thinking about the sun. Um, so thinking like a forest is thinking about solar power because sun, the, the sun runs ecosystems and the sun should be running our human systems as well. Um, uh, we live on a 40 acre farm uh, outside of Ann Arbor. Um, I haven't burned a gram of fossil fuel uh, since 2009 to heat the house, uh, to heat our to cook our food, to heat our water. We've been off the electrical grid since 2007, uh, and um, really focused on using local vernacular type techniques and materials to build our farmstead. So using simple things like soil, clay, uh, sand, and and stone straw and uh, salvaged lumber or salvaged trees. In this case, I used a bunch of ash trees that were killed by an invasive beetle here in Michigan while well, it's all over North America now, which is the emerald ash borer that started in Michigan. So this is the house I designed and built. Um, it's a straw bale building. Um, I don't want to get too lost in technical details. Happy to answer some questions, but it, um, it, it's thinking about the sun all the time. So we're using sun to do greenhouse effect inside the building. So we're doing solar thermal gain uh, with south facing windows. We're using the sun to make all of our electricity with solar panels. In the summertime, we're using the sun to do solar thermal to make solar hot water. We're using the sun to grow our pasture, to grow food for animals. And we're using the sun to grow food for the humans uh, as well. So we're really all the time thinking about sun, convection currents, cooling currents, wind directions, wind patterns, uh, things that don't require mechanical in interventions. We aren't doomsteaders. Uh, we're not preppers. I talk to those folks. Those folks engage me in conversation all the time, which is kind of cool. Lots of people thinking about energy and, and EMPs and, and 
uh, zombies, which you know I'm not worried about. I'm more worried about that 1.5 degree change. We're certainly not members of the tiny house movement either, which is a cool movement. It's a hard movement to undertake in Michigan, where we spend most of the year inside our buildings. On average, Americans spend 90% of our time inside of buildings. So it's no wonder we're consuming 75% of that total grid load. Um, so in the north, having buildings that are very efficient uh, for the cold winters is of critical importance. So for me, sourcing materials was really important, keeping them local, avoiding energy content and shipping and processing uh, more technophilic materials. These are all bio-centric uh, and earth-centric uh, sorts of materials um, close by to, to, to our building site. Um, you can see some shots here of the interior. Um, to, to get these, when we built this house, straw bale buildings aren't part of building code. So that's another conversation to have. It's a different lecture, but to talk about um, policy and, and how we change uh, people's understanding of how we can reach these kinds of energy goals by doing different kinds of things than conventional building or things that are easy for auditors and building inspectors to understand because they're in their thick code books. So how do we, how do we bend those uh, or amend those rules uh, to be able to do more innovative things. Again, that can save us those carbon footprints. These photos are taken probably in late October, early November when the sun really starts to come in to our building. Uh, and uh, on a sunny day like today, the internal temperature of our building can go up as much as eight or 10 degrees just on its own because of um, basically greenhouse effect. Um, all this wood that you see here is stuff I've milled at the at the farm, uh, avoiding, again, uh, environmental justice issues, uh, forest justice issues, sustainability questions about how you source your lumber, how you get good lumber, how the people are treated, how the animals are treated, how the soil's treated. Um, those are all really important questions to be asking as you design and use materials. Here's a few key points about uh, a straw bale building. There's a few around in the state. Um, certainly, we're one of the biggest residences in the state, and we actually have um, some load-bearing components in our building, which is unusual. Um, one of the big things about doing these kinds of natural builds is using earthen plasters, or basically using the earth, clay, and sand uh, to, to do your walls with. So you've heard probably of adobe, adobe bricks, cob buildings, hempcrete, uh, rammed earth, all of those are variations of using uh, basically soil. So my family and I really did build the building ourselves. It was uh, an undertaking over a couple of years. There's my sawmill moving those uh, dead ash trees into usable timber and lumber. Um, it's a timber frame building, so it holds the timber frame, supports the, the roof and the second story, and you can see that it's just big blocks of straw that gives you a really thick, highly insulated wall, um, about triple the insulation of a conventional house. Plus, it's a high carbon sink, so we're able to take, stabilize all that carbon from the leftover chaff, the waste material of growing wheat or oats or barley or rye or, or rice, and keep it in place for probably two or 300 years. We do burn biomass, so we do burn wood. We're in a forested state in Michigan. Um, I make sure that this is a gasifying boiler that uh, far exceeds air quality standards for wood burning, um, and we are able to burn smaller quantities of wood because of the efficiency of that device. We behaviorally adapt. We move in and out of our envelope, depending on the season, the north side of the house, the south side of the house. This is a summer kitchen on the north side of our house because it naturally stays cooler in the summertime. Most of our cooking happens outside to keep the heat load out of the house uh, in the summertime. Um, that's our... Um, if you look up here in the upper right, that's our PV array. It's not a very big array. It's, it's 15 panels. It's a four kilowatt array, but it's on a dual axis tracker. So that tracker follows the sun during the day, which gives us maybe as much as 60, 70% more electricity out of those panels. So it's letting those panels operate at peak performance all day long. Just to give you an idea of how affordable solar has become, uh, when I purchased those panels and put them up in 2007, I paid over $5.50 a watt for those panels, and they're 250 watt to 300 watt panels. You can do the math. 
Uh, and you can get comparable efficient panels today for about 95 cents a watt. So solar prices have crashed since just 2007. Um, these are some of our sheep. We do rare breeds. We've been breeding these guys. These are called um, Jacob sheep. So keeping genetics in play, we're, we're not vegetarians, but we only eat meat uh, two times a week. Um, it all, all said and done, we, um, we grow about half of our food budget every year. Um, this is my storage system since we're off the grid. Um, no fancy Tesla batteries. Um, I, I'm not convinced yet that uh, the, the lithium price uh, the, and, and not the monetary price for the lithium, but the earth burden price for the lithium outperforms these lead acid batteries. These are golf cart batteries. They're six volt batteries, simple technology. Um, these are two strings of 30 batteries. So a six volt battery times 30 is 180 volts. So the resting voltage of our system is 180 volts. I've got a simple computer that I check uh, two or three times a day to understand uh, how our system's done that day, how much electricity we have in the bank. And that tells us what we can and can't do at the house. So if it's a full sunny day, like it is today, I could be in my workshop working hard, running my heavy equipment. We could be doing laundry. We could have on electric heaters. We could run the microwave. We could be doing everything we wanted to do. But if it's a long cloudy stretch in Michigan and we're off the grid, I don't have a backup. I don't run my shop. We don't do the laundry, we don't run the microwave. So we are behaviorally paying attention to what's going down. And you know, you turn out the lights and you understand, you understand your numbers. So one of the first things here is, is really learning to pay attention to what's going down. So over the past more than a decade, these are our averages. Um, I won't get us too lost here, but you can kind of see in 2016, we were hitting pretty high there at 37 kilowatt hours per day. Um, for an average American house. And at our high use, we're about 20, 22 kilowatt hours a day. And in the winter time, um, we can go as low as four or five kilowatt hours a day uh, if the sun isn't out. So really, really paying attention. There's our garden. My wife is a, is a uh, elementary school teacher, so she has her summers off. We're in the midst of lambing right now, cute lambs. We do these rare breed pigs that are critically endangered. Doesn't mean they're expensive, but it's they're called mule foot pigs. They're a lard pig. We do these are uh, endangered species of rabbits. And we have a lot of poultry too. Uh, keep bees, and uh, I do hunt our property too. Um, so there again, you can kind of see a late fall day. You know the place is designed to to catch the sun. I've done a couple of builds here in, at U of M with students uh, to, to kind of teach some of these principles, but also to help move the needle on building practices at U of M. Uh, U of M's kind of, we are lagging behind. This is a little straw bale building up at the U University of Michigan Biological Field Station, which is, it's like 18 miles to the bridge up in Pelston, Michigan, almost to the UP. <laughs> so this was the first uh, faculty designed student built building in more than 150 years at the U. Uh, and uh, we built that thing in a month. So pretty cool. Um, we got a little grant for a little one kilowatt system. So it's really possible for you all to be messing around with small solar systems and think about bigger solar systems, um, which we'll dig in and, uh, as some ideas here in a sec. This is another straw bale building at the campus farm here in Ann Arbor. Again, it's a little off-grid building with a one kilowatt system, but again, straw bale. This one used a clay floor inside, so it's an earthen floor. So we really, really minimized our concrete use in this building. We use it for farm to table events and some classes meet out there and other interesting things, um, but it's a beautiful little building. Um, not heated, not used in the winter. This is one of the things we're doing this summer is taking some campus trees and turning it into a pavilion for an outdoor kitchen space at the campus farm, which will be pretty cool. So, okay, um, we'll, we'll cruise through some ideas here. I wanted to pivot a little bit here to think about things that y'all can do as, as high schoolers. Uh, and um, some of these are really easy and some of these are pretty difficult to think about, um, but I would encourage you to think about um, doing some of these hard things and, and uh, uh, you could really change the culture of your local school districts if you if you had some success here. Um, first and foremost is um, a pretty easy thing for you to do, and I think you're probably all on that trajectory already because you're here at this conference today, um, and you're probably enrolled in, in 
uh, similar classes, but that's to learn about climate change and all the details and science about it, uh, but also to learn how to discuss the details of climate change with folks. So being able to talk about it with your friends and family, um, you know, we, we, you know, I certainly have uh, family members who are uh, climate change deniers and being able to engage conversations uh, with the importance of climate change, that importance of that one and a half degree uh, cap, that importance of hitting that 50% goal in eight years, that importance of being carbon neutral in 2050. You know, those are conversations that need to happen with your school administrations, your, your school boards. You know, what's, we can't have business as usual at all of our school districts across the country. We all need to start digging in. And student advocacy is a great way uh, to get things to move. And we're seeing that at U of M, the, the student advocacy is, is definitely having an effect. If you've not dug into Climate Central, it's a great place to, to get some good details about climate science, as well as being able to learn how to talk about it. Uh, Climate.nasa.gov is a great place with cool imagery, that video that with the, with the uh, atmosphere looking like it's on fire, swirling around is, you can find that through here. Uh, and then there's other groups like the Climate Reality Project and 350.org. Bill McKibben is the founder of 350.org uh, and they do big creative events, uh, artists in engagements, uh, climate marches, things to be paying attention to and things that you can probably latch onto through your student orgs. Certainly understanding your own carbon footprints is uh, gonna be an important thing. Um, you know, I would recommend doing a bunch of different carbon footprint calculators. Um, understanding what their motivation is, where, where they're getting their numbers, how they're telling you what to do at the end of those things. Uh, but the more you can get familiar with your own personal footprints, the better off um, you're going to understand about, hey, how do, I, how do I do half of what I'm doing in eight years? It's, it's not an easy question to address. So second is paying attention to your energy use and its production. So figuring out like you know, certainly we're tied to a complicated grid, uh, but what power stations are closest to where you live? Who lives by those power stations? How is that power being generated? Um, what are their plans? What's, who are the energy providers? What are their plans to pivot some of that? Is your school district in conversation with them? If they aren't, what a great opportunity for you as student advocates and activists to be able to lead that charge uh, and get things to move. Um, shrink your footprint, shrink that footprint.com is a British group, but I like this visualization because they put it into categories. So housing is in red, travel is that blue, food is the orange or yellow, uh, uh, services uh, and products. So, you know, you can, you can start to think about how does your own footprint move through there, but how does your school's footprint move through there? Again, three quarters of our buildings or three quarters of electricity is going to our buildings. Heating is a huge thing. Dude, if you could get your administration to cut back your thermostat by two, three, four, five degrees in the winter time, you might hit a 10% energy savings in the first year, easy. But then it's like, oh, no more, you know, no one's gonna wanna wear tank tops if the school is, is 65 or 66 degrees. That's okay, we live in Michigan in the winter time. Making sure all your lights are LED lights, easy enough to do. You guys can walk around the building, check them out. Like, hey, let's change those. You can do a fundraiser and change them yourself if the admin says they can't. But the good news is, is if you're saving energy, your district is gonna save money. So same thing with that air conditioning in the summer, jack up that thermostat in the summer, a little bit warmer in the building in the summertime. These buildings aren't designed to, to, to convect uh, and, and use transoms or earth tubes or anything naturally. We're using HVAC systems, which is not great design, but that's another conversation. Um, paying attention to, and, and understanding your numbers. So you should be able to figure out what your buildings are using. You can start to get a sense of what your appliances are using. That little gizmo that you're plugging in there in the wall is called a kilowatt meter, K-I-L-L-A-Watt, W-A-T-T. They're about 20, 25 bucks a piece. Some local libraries stock them. You can plug them in, see what any appliance is using live. You can leave it plugged in for a day or a week and see what it uses. And you'll learn like a microwave when it's on high uses the same amount of wattage that a table saw could use, even a table saw under load. 
and we just don't even think about that. So how and where and you know refrigerators, extra refrigerators, extra pop coolers in the building, like how do we cut 50% by 2030? Yeah, all can be creative and think about it. How can we cut 15% this year? Most um, energy providers have smart meters and apps that you can do some tracking. Um, you know, there's that kilowatt meter again. You can get third party devices like this sense meter that you can put into uh, uh, an electric box, a circuit breaker box, and have an app, and it gets smart enough to tell you, like, hey, your refrigerator is on now, and that's a big part of your load, or your, your um, air conditioner is on. Uh, and, you know, once you kind of understand where your power is going, then you can start to target, like, how do I trim it back? The solution here is in combination. We got to cut back and also pivot to sustainable. When we want to replace things and get more efficient, energystar.gov is a great place to go. Realize that all Energy Star rated appliances are not the same. Energy Star rating is a minimum bar. Above that bar, you could find a refrigerator that could be two or three times more efficient than the minimum bar. So don't just blindly consume something from Energy Star and go, hey, it's great because it's Energy Star. Go download their spreadsheets. You can find a net, you can find a fridge that's the same price as that minimum bar, and it uses half the amount of electricity as the one that gets the rating. Beware of Jevons paradox. If you're not familiar with it, look it up. I don't want to get us lost, but it's it's about efficiency. When things get more efficient, we actually end up consuming more. And the, the easy thing for us to think about is hey, we might have replaced the fridge in the house, but instead of getting rid of the old fridge, we turn it into a beer cooler, pop cooler overflow leftover cooler in the garage. So instead of reaping the benefits of a really efficient new refrigerator, now we're running two refrigerators, the crappy old inefficient one plus the new one. TVs are so cheap, like swap it out, have a family conversation. How many TVs do we need? Like we don't need five. How many do we need? Can we get by with one? You know, the other's gotta go away. Uh, certainly LED lights, super efficient but it doesn't mean like now lighting designers are going crazy. Like they're putting in lights in on everything because they're so efficient. And we need to push back and say like, dude, no, we, we can't add to the load. We need to minimize the load. So more efficient and less is the answer. Vampires is something you should be aware of. So like turning off your stuff um, is of critical importance. Um, I read a report last year that um, somebody crunched the numbers in France, which has a lot of nuclear power, that if everyone in France actually turned off their electronic devices, their computers, their monitors, their printers, when they weren't using them and didn't leave them in sleep mode, they could shut down an entire nuclear power plant in France. They're burning up an entire nuclear plant in the country of France just to keep computers in sleep mode. That's crazy, crazy, bad design, bad use. Make sure we turn that stuff off and either turn them off by hand or use you know some bluetooth devices or put it on a light switch or put it on a power strip okay here's where you know i bite my tongue because michigan state is kicking u of m's butt in this this is their um, big solar uh, carport that they put uh, next to their stadium uh, what a great initiative it was one faculty person at at michigan state and this is a good example of policy Policies at Michigan State are a, a lot more uh, friendly than U of M policies uh, because we can't get this to happen at U of M policy because uh, of some of our policymakers. Um, but this is what I'd encourage you to do. You want to move into the deep end of the pool, people. You, you want to um, do something difficult that would make a real difference, like start working with some local solar providers, start working with your administrators, get yourselves organized and cover all your parking lots at all your schools and all of your district with solar. And you can make a huge difference in that renewable use, hitting that 50% goal by 2030, and even getting a big goal by 2050 and save the district money at the same time. Everybody should be able to get behind that. There are other organizations like Groundswell that helps us do that. Y'all could get organized when people, there are no bots in the world, people that'll be like, well, what happens when they get covered with snow? Well, I'll be like, cool, this, that's what a perfect project for a bunch of students to get out there with battery powered leaf blowers and blow the, blow the snow off or brush the snow off. 
This is a um, hundred acres of solar going in at MSU. Good for them, man, 20 megawatts. You could do that. This is a school down in um, uh, Batesville School District. Where is that? It's in Arkansas. Uh, a bunch of kids got together and said like, let's do some solar. And their administration was thoughtful enough about and said like, yeah, let's do it. We could use the money. And they used the money to give all their teachers raises. So like, you wanna make friends with your, your, your faculty? Like get them on your side and be like, let's crunch the numbers. Let's get some solar companies. Let's cover our parking lots with solar. Let's save the district's money, but more importantly, let's save some carbon. Uh, win, win, win all across. All right, I'm gonna really cruise here. Pay attention to your food. Food has a footprint, certainly eating beef, eating ruminants. So beef and lamb is, uh, are the really carbon dense things. Start working with your cafeterias, start to minimize. Think about uh, uh, sustainable Mondays or meat-free Mondays, uh, vegetarian Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. Start to have that conversation about how to eat a more carbon-friendly diet at your cafeterias and at home. Uh, other aspect of that is animal rights. So I'm sure some of you are vegetarian and vegan and knowing about CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations. It's not, a, it's not a nice way. It's not good to the animals. It's not good to the soil, to the earth, to the air, to the water, to the humans that are, are dealing with these systems. It's the high cost of, of, of low prices of meat. Um, thinking about local production, farmers markets, regional farms, uh, all important stuff opportunities for you guys to do some raised bed food growing, vermiculture beds, uh, pollinator garden, gardens, even maybe keeping some bees on your campus could be possible. Keeping some chickens on your campus could be possible. Um, good stuff to do. Not as cool as the energy stuff. The energy stuff's gonna have higher long-term impact, but some of this is beautiful short-term impact. Thinking about third-party certifications, fair trade, uh, coffee and chocolate, Thinking about your stuff is next on the list. Recycling is not a great answer. We're not gonna hit those goals through recycling. The recycling markets are bad. Um, so yeah, make sure you have recycling bins around the building, but I wouldn't put my efforts, like I wouldn't put all my eggs as a student advocate at your campus to think about recycling as your primary cause. I would think about energy as your primary cause. Reducing your plastic, doing some clothing repairs, making sure you have clothing swaps or, or going around. And the last thing is certainly thinking about your community, being very strategic about not losing gains because a lot of student organizations, you know, you've got great student leadership and seniors, uh, they graduate and you lose ground. So seniors in the group really be mindful about how you get juniors and sophomores and first years all involved that you can keep the momentum moving. Um, I do that with my group here. This is my group on campus, the, the sustainable living experience. I would be, you know, this is me doing a, a pitch, but like, Come to U of M and come live with us at, at SLE and we can kind of continue some of these conversations. Quarter till, I went up maybe five minutes longer than I would have liked to, but i um, happy to um, have some questions, discussion. I'll stop my share. Have at it here, people. All right, we have uh, one question rolling in from an anonymous uh, attendee. Mm -hmm. For students trying to encourage their school to get solar panels, what would be the best way to approach the board or to encourage them to get the solar panels, especially if the schools don't favor climate benefits? Uh -huh. You know, I would crunch the numbers as best you can on your own. You can certainly engage. There's enough solar companies around these days. You could, you know, start conversations with some of them. Um, you know, maybe working with some of your faculty. Uh, and by the time you crunch the numbers, you know, there's, there's websites out there that you can calculate the surface area of roofs. Um, and roofs are okay to use, but solar panels actually like to be cool. So in the parking lots is actually a better place to install them. Uh, and you can, you can start to crunch the numbers and figure out like, yeah, here's the initial investment, uh, but here's the savings over time. Um, at bottom dollar, they should pay attention. If they're not going to pay attention to the climate change argument, they certainly could pay attention to the bottom dollar argument. Uh, that was my alarm going off, reminding me that we have 10 minutes left. You. Uh, I have a personal question, actually. Uh, earlier, when you were talking about uh, your house, uh, you mentioned that uh, the cost of lithium mining. Uh, I'd like to hear more about that from your perspective. Um, well, there's going to be, you know, rare earth minerals uh, definitely have, mining has a footprint for sure. And uh, the EPA is not 
uh, active around the planet. So as we offshore a lot of our consumption, uh, you know, we have manufacturing happening beyond our borders. We're basically offshoring our pollution. Uh, and there are opportunities for lithium mining in the US, but um, you know, there's going to be an environmental footprint associated with that. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's just all part of a conversation about what will become best practice. And at this point, lead acid batteries, uh, 99, it's the single highest recycled item in North America. 99.x percent of lead acid batteries are recycled. Um, and the, the chemistry footprint of that is, is far less harmful than dealing with lithium mines. Doesn't mean that, you know, having lithium batteries in a vehicle, uh, you know, makes a lot more sense than a giant array of lead acid batteries. We just have to be wise about where we put them. So I'm, I'm skeptical about, you know, Tesla wall batteries, because Tesla has built up a brand of being cool, and they've done a lot of great things with electric vehicles and, and consumption of electric vehicles. Um, but it might not necessarily be the same impact of, of uh, distributed storage systems. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what is your favorite part of your sustainable house? Ah, um, well, I, there's a lot of favorite parts to it. I mean, you know, it depends on the season. Um, you know, a day like today, it's just really nice to be cozy and warm inside and appreciate the benefits of a nice sunny day and feeling the sun. Uh, and, you know, in particular with a straw bale wall, you have those really deep window sills. The walls are two feet thick. So you have these really beautiful uh, details with a, with a thick window sill so you can keep plants in there and just the textures of that plaster. Uh, and, and certainly, I, you know, people are starting to talk about the so-called IKEA effect uh, of people uh, treating their IKEA furniture differently than other furniture because they had a, a role to play in it. So even though it was just like putting together a puzzle, they still have ownership over that. So homeowner built things, uh, ha you have a different relationship with that. So learning to cook your, your best meal, learning to cook a very carbon friendly meal, you'll, you'll have a different relationship with that than going to a restaurant or consuming otherwise. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, other than mitigation strategies focusing on behaviors, have, do you know of any promising technology that could reduce greenhouse gases directly, like some sort of carbon eraser? Yeah, um, the best carbon eraser we have is leaving um, forests intact. So being Excellent. really, really vigilant about no forest loss. So um, the numbers are clear that if we uh, are clearing forests and replanting those replanted forests uh, replanted forests are not nearly as effective as carbon sinks as the old forests so you know one of the best things we can do right now is draw a line and say like no more loss just like we need to draw a line and say like no more fossil fuel extraction and we're not burning it so you know it's much easier to to not burn it in the first place than having to mitigate with it at the at the end uh another question i know a lot of houses require upkeep or fixes how does that work with your uh straw house mm -hmm. um there's maintenance uh like any house like you say um you know part of it is good design if you notice the house has a, a stone wall that's about three feet tall all around the whole building mm -hmm. and that stone wall is designed it's called a stem wall and it's designed to keep the bales up off the ground where they could get wet and damaged. So keeping the bales dry, you know, basically the maintenance of any house is keeping your, your roof really sound. So a good hat and good boots so that your foundation is, is cared for as well. Uh, and that means keeping your house dry. So if you can keep the house dry, you're in good shape. Um, those natural plasters, uh, they can erode over time. That south side of our house, I designed it to be very weather exposed. Uh, and now it's been up there for 12, almost 13 years. And I might have to do another layer of plaster over it in the next year, year and a half. Um, but I, I would kind of put that as, in the same bucket as like painting your house. The, the, the clay plasters on the north side of my house, because it's colder and wetter, was very much designed to keep uh, no weather on them at all. So 
those haven't received any damage at all and they, they should be good as long as my roof stays sound which it's a metal roof you know it should stay sound for a hundred years um, those walls should stay intact awesome uh we have another question. Uh, I am going to University of Michigan in the fall. What is SLE? I'm interested. Okay, SLE, I'm glad you're interested. Please sign up. SLE is the Sustainable Living Experience. It's a living learning community. So when you're filling out your housing application, there's a separate little application that you have to fill out to say, yeah, I wanna live uh, with all those tree huggers in SLE. Uh, and um, we have a dedicated house with about 30, 35 residents uh, very close to the Arboretum on campus. And um, there's a required seminar that you have to take uh, your first semester and second semester with me. And we've got other activities going on all the time. So pop me an email if you can't find it. But if you, um, you know, just Google SLE UMIS, you should find it. That's cool. Y'all are welcome to join. Uh, looks like we probably have only time for uh, maybe one or two more questions. Uh, what do you think of a pumped storage hydroelectric system as energy storage system for a city or electric system in a future? Uh -huh. um, Michigan actually use, utilizes some pumped uh, hydro storage along <laughs> the lake. Um, and it's a great idea, uh, especially if you know, you're um, able to mitigate some carbon out of that equation. So, you know, if you're able to be more efficient and if you're having to burn carbon, if you're able to reduce that footprint by doing some pump storage, that's great. Um, but especially it would be great if, if you were using wind or solar to do some of that pump storage and be able to use that storage on a cloudy day or, you know, a day that's not windy. Those things working in combination can work really nicely, but you need the geography to be able to, to do that, of course. Wind and solar systems can be great hybrids together. And, you know, that could be an equation if you were thinking about it on your on your high school campuses of thinking about putting up a windmill in addition to the solar. The, the windmills can get expensive because they've got to, for them to work efficiently, they've got to be at least 100 feet in the air and they have regular maintenance. Um, you know, if you were in a really windy place, that might be a great way to think about it. And the wind can blow at night and on cloudy days. Uh, you know, which are usually not the sunny days, uh, but we know that the sun is going to come out every day uh, and well, the sun is going to rise every day. Um, so we have at least solar potential every day. And even on a cloudy day, those panels are going to work as long as they're cleared. So having a strategy to keep the snow off of them uh, is an important Michigan strategy. I believe, uh, doesn't Ludington, Michigan have one of the uh, country's biggest uh, hydroelectric uh, pump well, I don't know how it ranks nationally. Um, I would bet, you know, there's some natural hydro systems in Idaho. Idaho has a huge amount of, of hydropower. Um, but yeah, in the Midwest, for sure. Yeah, Ludington and I think Muskegon has one too. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we are out of questions and I think we're uh, just about out of time. Thank you so much for coming, Professor Trump. That was a uh, really, really interesting presentation that you gave. Great, my pleasure. Good luck, everyone. Get, uh, get active and uh, keep talking to folks and get yourselves organized. Of course, yeah. Uh,